UBS and Notre Dame are located on Pokagon and Potawatomi land. The Pokagon Potawatomi have been using this land for formation and education for thousands of years, and they continue doing so. My name is Jana Hunter Bowman, and I'm Assistant Professor of Peace Studies and Christian Social Ethics at AMBS and a member of the Kroc Institute Advisory Board. I'm joined by Jason Shank, a Quaker minister and organizer here in Elkhart, who's a co-facilitator of the colloquium in welcoming you. In this co-sponsored series, voices from different streams of nonviolence, including communal, liberationist, and strategic nonviolence, are speaking as witnesses to the power of nonviolence in action. We're exploring urgent issues of racialized violence and high stakes election scenarios, as well as strategic nonviolent responses. Two of the world's most prominent voices on strategic nonviolence are with us today to discuss election related mobilization. We are asking, what can we and our communities do to help ensure a peaceful electoral transition and reduce the risk of violence at Black Lives Matters protests? It is my great pleasure to introduce you to David Courtright, one of the co-conspirators of this series and my co-host from the Kroc Institute today. David is the director of the Global Policy Initiative and Professor Emeritus of the Practice at the Keough School of Global Affairs at the University of Notre Dame. Previously, David was the director of policy studies at the Kroc Institute and director of the Institute's Peace Accord Matrix Project, the largest collection of peace accord implementation data that exists. Now, his qualifications to speak to the topic of nonviolence are perhaps most visible, not in his job titles, but in his writing. Quite a few of the 19 books he authored or co-edited respond to the questions of students or fellow citizens. Nonviolence is nice, but is it practical? These books, his responses include Civil Society, Peace and Power, Gandhi and Beyond, Nonviolence for a New Political Age. This is now in its second edition. Peace, A History of Movements and Ideas, and Uniting Against Terror, Cooperative Non-Military Responses to the Global Terrorist Threat. And those are just a few of the titles. In this far too brief sketch, I have not done justice to David's life work. I want to underscore that these impressive qualifications and accomplishments are expressions of my dear friend and mentor's tireless dedication to peace. Thank you, David, for your witness to the power of nonviolence. And I hand it over to you to introduce our guest speaker today. He's muted. Okay, is that better? Thank you. Well, hello everyone. Sorry for the little technical glitch. Of course, there would be at least one. Um, and thank you, Jana, for that uh, very generous, overly generous introduction. Um, I tried to, tried to recognize myself in that, but thank you. But I am very grateful for that. Uh, I'm delighted to be with all of you and thank the, thankful that you're here for this important conversation and especially pleased and honored uh, to be able to introduce my colleague and friend, uh, Maria Stefan, uh, who has done so much to enlighten us and expand our horizons of understanding about the power of civil resistance, nonviolent civil resistance. Uh, Maria and her colleague, Erica Chenoweth, have really revolutionized our understanding around the world on these issues uh, in their 2011 uh, classic it's already a classic book, uh, Why Civil Resistance Works, The Strategic Logic of Nonviolent Conflict. And most don't know that three years before that, they published uh, their core thesis and their data in the journal International Security with the same title, Why Civil Resistance Works, uh, in a journal that normally is focusing on 
military deterrence and strategic theory and uh, military strategies. Uh, and here comes this seminal article using data to show that nonviolent civil resistance is more than twice as effective as the use of armed struggle and violent means. And then it continued to publish uh, other articles showing uh, that nonviolence uh, is more effective than uh, violent means. Uh, and also helping us to see what are the dynamics within uh, the data that they've collected on more than 300 conflicts around the world and now the hundreds more since they first published uh, their materials in 2011 in the book form. Uh, so hundreds of cases now able to demonstrate that nonviolence is indeed uh, more effective. So it tells us all that nonviolence is not only the right thing to do, the morally appropriate choice, it's also the politically effective means for bringing about a significant social change. And it helps us also understand that uh, those who would be tempted to use violence, uh, engaging in fighting and uh, destructive acts, may think that they're helping the cause, but often those kinds of tactics uh, tend to be uh, counterproductive. They undermine the overall strategic goals, may dampen the degree of mass participation, which is so key to the effectiveness. Uh, and we may end up actually hurting the movements that we're trying to help when we resort to uh, more violent means, more destructive means. It's the power and dignity of organized, disciplined, nonviolent civil resistance that can bring about political change. So, let me turn it over to you, Maria, if you could say more about that, and especially in the context of our current uh, dilemmas in this country, dealing with the impending election and great uncertainty about the outcome, and of course, the violence that's been uh, visited upon some of the Black Lives Matter protest movements. All right, there we go. Well, David, thank you for that kind introduction. And um, I want to thank you and Jana and your colleagues at AMBS and at the Kroc Institute at Notre Dame for inviting me to participate in this colloquium series on understanding and engagement, engaging movements for justice in 2020. I can't think of a more um, important and timely topic uh, right now, especially in this country. Um, and, you know, we're having this conversation today about just over a month um, before a really <clears throat> consequential election. And some of you all may have seen the, the debate last night, um, depressing in many ways, but also for me at least, uh, motivating to roll up my sleeves and work even harder um, in the month ahead. So the stakes are really high now. Um, we're also in the, the midst of a pandemic, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic that has killed over 206,000 uh, Americans, um, has definitely exposed and exacerbated uh, inequalities and injustices, including structural racism in this country. And we're also having this conversation in the wake of nationwide protests against police brutality following the murder of George Floyd, uh, Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Arbery, and countless other Black lives. And I would note that those protests led by Black Lives Matter and the movement for Black Lives were the broadest and the most persistent in US history, according to my colleague Erica Chenoweth and her colleagues at the Crowd Counting Consortium. So I think um, Jason's going to post a link to that article um, in the Washington Post uh, that, that explains that really uh, interesting statistic. So I, I guess just my first message and uh, plea is for everyone who's joining um, this uh, webinar and colloquium to please get out and perform your civic duty to vote um, and encourage friends and family to vote, have a plan, uh, volunteer to be a poll worker. Um, we'll have some resources on a slide at the end of this presentation, but um, I guess that's just my uh, bottom line up front, if you will, um, to, to start the conversation. And 
So as, as David mentioned, I've spent most of my professional life focusing on political violence and its alternatives, including um, nonviolent civil resistance. And just as a definition, um, when I say civil resistance, I'm referring to a means for ordinary people to advance rights, freedoms, justice, peace, using active nonviolent means like protests, vigils, boycotts, strikes, sit-ins, non-cooperation. So all active nonviolent means, um, but without threatening or using violence to inflict harm on other, other people. So um, uh, David mentioned the research and the work with Erica Chenoweth, which I'll turn to in, in just a second. Um, but I've really, I've spent um, you know, most of the past a uh, couple of decades working with activists and movements who have been involved in different nonviolent struggles around the world, um, including in Syria um, during the nonviolent phase of the popular uprising that began in 2011, um, working with activists and movements in Sudan, where we saw last year a popular nonviolent uprising removed a 30 year military dictatorship, quite remarkably. Um, also, have been working with activists and movements in Nicaragua, which um, also saw a, a popular movement emerge last year that's been led by students, women, religious leaders, campesinos, um, advocating and pushing for a more just and peaceful society. So I've also, as part of this research and work, studied uh, authoritarianism and authoritarian resurgence around the world, including in this country, the United States, whose um, dem democracy scores have actually been falling uh, considerably. And that's something that's been recorded by the, the Freedom um, Watchdog, uh, the, the organization that monitors civil li liberties and political rights called Freedom House. And so around the world, you know, we're seeing this rise in nationalism, xenophobia, Phobia, the hollowing out of democratic norms and discourse and institution. We're seeing a lot of dehumanizing of the other, um, criminalization of dissent that we're seeing in different places, including in this country. We're seeing a rise of disinformation, the idea of fake or false news, and efforts to make people believe that there's no such thing as objective truth. So this is a trend that is actually quite global. It's been going on now for almost two decades, and it's hit home, uh, certainly in the United States, so definitely concerning. So at the same time, though, that we've kind of seen this uh, resurgence of authoritarianism globally, we've also seen a rise in people power movements around the world. And I would note that last year, uh, 2019, um, had the largest number of protests and popular movements ever recorded around the world. And you can think about the cases of Sudan, uh, the popular movement in Algeria, Chile, Nicaragua, the climate protests. There was a massive explosion of people power globally. So I think that the positive sign is that while there are obviously huge problems with governance um, and rising nationalism and kind of shrinking of civic space, we're also seeing a resurgence of civic voice and people demanding um, that their voices be heard and participating actively um, in civic and political life. So, you know, the the research that I've done on um, nonviolent resistance has certainly informed my recent conversations with domestic organizers and movement leaders in the US. And I've been learning a ton from them, um, from Movement for Black Lives, Sunrise, Indivisible, um, you know, a whole host of different kind of um, grassroots movements that have been active on a number of causes uh, in the US. And, you know, what's been interesting is that they in turn have been interested in learning about the research on civil resistance and hearing from global international um, examples of how other people have waged nonviolent struggle in places where, you know, um, either there's a democratic backsliding or in the context of violence. So it's been a really interesting kind of exchange and back and forth over the past um, few weeks, uh, which, um, you know, has been really, really interesting. And and you know, folks are especially interested in the nonviolent struggles um, that 
around the world in places like Serbia, Ukraine, the Gambia, where people organized and mobilized to ensure that the results of elections were protected when after they were after they were stolen essentially. So when the incumbent presidents tried to steal the election, um, people rose up nonviolently um, and ensured that the, the results were respected and the, and the rule of law was upheld. So American organizers now in this context are very interested in kind of learning from, from some of these examples. So I, I think I'll just spend a couple of minutes um, uh, you know, going over some of the key findings from the research that I conducted um, with Erica um, all those years ago, as, as David mentioned. So in the, the study that culminated in the book, Why Civil Resistance Works, um, Erica and I examined over 330 major campaigns, violent and nonviolent, um, from 1900 to 2006. So these were large political campaigns challenging incumbent regimes and uh, vying for territorial self-determination. And so the central question at the heart of that research was which form of resistance, violent or nonviolent, has been more effective at achieving its major political goals. And to you know, cut a long story short, the major finding of that book, as David noted, was that the nonviolent campaigns have historically been twice as effective as the violent campaigns. They succeeded about 53% of the time compared to 26% of the time for the violent campaigns. And we also found that over the longer term, the nonviolent campaigns tended to contribute to democratization um, and were less likely to result in a society that fell back into civil war or violent conflict after. So both in the short term and in the longer term, civil resistance was more effective than violent struggle. And so I'll ask uh, Jason to post a, a second link of an article in the Washington Post um, uh, that kind of summarizes some of the research. So even if uh, you don't get around to reading the whole book, this um, is kind of has some of the key findings in a nutshell, if you will. So the the main reason, if um, if I were to distill the the main findings of the of the book in a couple of lines, the the most significant variable um, explaining the outcome of these campaigns and the reason why nonviolent campaigns have been so much more effective than armed campaigns is that the nonviolent campaigns tend to attract mass diverse participation participation, far more participation than armed resistance campaigns. And when you think about it, um, lots of people, anyone can participate in nonviolent campaigns, young or old, men or women, um, you know, elderly youth, um, you know, disabled, able body. There's something for everyone in nonviolent resistance because there are so many different tactics available, um, you know, from silent vigils to wearing of symbolic um, you know, wearing of symbols or, you know, engaging in a consumer boycott or a labor strike. There are so many things people can do. And when you have large numbers of people from different parts of society who stop obeying and engage in organized non-cooperation, that tends to uh, result in a lot of power um, and makes, you know, uh, nonviolent movements particularly effective, even against kind of violent opponents. So um, the nonviolent campaign were something like 15 times larger um, than the violent campaigns in our in our data set. So mass diverse participation was key. We also found that nonviolent discipline in the face of violent repression um, was really key to the success of this movement. And this is something that David mentioned. Violence is often used against peaceful protesters around the world. In fact, in over 90% of the campaigns that we examined, violence was used um, against the protesters. And so the, the, the kind of strategic problem with mixing violent and nonviolent tactics is that it tends to decrease participation. Um, it increases levels of violent repression and decreases um, the participation of ordinary people in the movement. And since you really need large, diverse participation to succeed, that's the problem. It also, adding violence to the mix tends to muddy the waters. It makes it kind of, it makes it easier for an opponent to justify the use of counterviolence, even though of course it's not a justify, but it makes it easier to make the case that we're responding to violence and chaos and we're restoring, yes, 
law and order, um, which is a very common refrain uh, kind of used by, by, by different governments and regimes around the world. So, you know, main, maintaining nonviolent discipline through codes of conduct, through marshals, through, you know, establishing the DNA of a movement to be nonviolent is really key to ensuring, um, you know, large numbers of people participating in the movement. The third variable I would say in, in um, a key ingredient to success is tactical innovation. Again, something that's really key in this moment. So the thing about nonviolent resistance is that it's so much more than street protests and demonstrations. They tend to get a lot of the attention and kind of the, the media focus. But in reality, some of the most powerful tactics in nonviolent resistance tend to be things like consumer boycotts. Think the, you know, the consumer boycotts targeting white owned businesses in apartheid South Africa. Incredibly powerful tactic. Uh, the labor strikes in, in Poland during the solidarity movement that helped pair shut down um, the country and apply, you know, tr tremendous economic pressure. You know, so nonviolent resistance is so much more than kind of the protests and movements that are able to alternate between kind of marches, rallies, uh, sit-ins to these other tactics of stay away, sit-ins, strikes, um, tend to be more resilient uh, to repression and more effective. And I think the last point I would note um, that I think is really relevant to our current moment is um, that there has been further research that Erica Chenoweth has conducted that um, has found that women's active participation in nonviolent movements is very strongly correlated with the success of those movements. So, um, you know, women's participation tends to increase nonviolent discipline um, in the campaign. And we see this now with women kind of being in the forefront of the protests in Belarus. So there's a lot, you know, of, um, you know, there's something to be said about empowering the voices of women in these movements. So I, I think this, the these findings are um, particularly relevant in this context where, you know, we're dealing with an upcoming election, we're dealing with structural racism and protests that have frankly forced a national reckoning in this country around race and racism. We're facing, you know, rising inequality in this country. We're facing a rise of far right violence. And this is a really important thing to note. There's a lot of kind of um, attention to Antifa and kind of a left wing violence. We know the experts have kind of said definitively that the number one domestic terrorism risk in the United States is far right violence. And so this is kind of the thing, the Proud Boys and Beyond is a, a significant challenge right now, um, as, as David and Jenna mentioned in, in kind of their opening. So I think one um, kind of important point to highlight from all of this is that, um, you know, while there's a lot of talk about protester violence and chaos in the streets in Portland and all this, the vast, vast, vast majority of protests in this country since Trump's election in 2016 have been nonviolent. So violence, property damage constitute a minute uh, portion of the protests that we've seen. Looting and vandalism, which does occur, it, I'm not saying it doesn't occur, but it tends to be committed by opportunists rather than people who are actively involved in the movement. So I'll ask uh, Jason to post a statistic in an article um, that shares um, you know, the statistic that in fact 93% of racial justice protests after the murder of George Floyd have been peaceful. And this is according to the Armed Conflict Location and Event Data, or ACLID, which was launched by the US Crisis Monitoring Port, uh, Report with the Bridging Divides Initiative at Princeton. So I'll um, also post the, the, the ACLID data just to give you a sense of kind of what the big picture is on uh, protests and violence and nonviolence in the US, just to put it into larger context when you see kind of the emphasis on violence and chaos in the street. And I, I think it's especially important to really center and uplift the voices of community leaders, movement leaders, notably Black, and persons of color who are leading these movements, who can often explain the strategies, who can explain the mechanisms that are being used to mitigate violence, diffuse violence, and their story should be at the forefront of media coverage of, of, of protests, uh, especially in this period and kind of leading up to, to the election. So I guess, um, you know, uh, 
in, in kind of wrapping up remarks so that we can get the, to the discussion, I did want to um, mention a, a resource um, that has, it's um, of an article that's gone viral uh, by Daniel Hunter from the organization Training for Change. Um, Daniel Hunter co-founded uh, a group called Choose Democracy. And he's written a piece um, that I think is very sobering and, and important to discuss in this moment, which is called 10 Things to Know About How to Stop a Coup. And so the, the gist of the article is that even though all attention right now should be focused on getting out the vote and ensuring mass participation in the electoral process, we as Americans need to also prepare for the possibility of a coup or an auto golpe, uh, meaning an executive kind of takeover a power of, of, of power. So the reality is that Trump may not acknowledge, he may stop the vote, or he may not acknowledge the results. Um, we don't know if it will happen, but there's enough evidence to suggest that we should prepare for it. And so I'll just um, kind of read out the, the 10 things that he said we need to know about how to stop a coup, uh, just for purpose of, of discussion later on. So the 10 things are number one, don't expect results on election night and we know it's gonna take days, if not weeks, for mail-in ballots to be counted. So number two, do call it a coup if there is an attempt to stop the vote count or to kind of um, dismiss the results. Um, do call it a coup. Number three, know that coups have been stopped by regular folks. Number four, be ready to act quickly and not alone. Number five, focus on widely shared values, not on individuals. Number six, convince people not to freeze or just go along, so encourage them to act. Number seven, commit to actions that represent rule of law, stability, and nonviolence. Number eight, yes, in fact, a coup can happen in the U.S. Number nine, center in calm, not fear. And number 10, prepare to deter a coup before the election, which is the ideal scenario. So I would encourage um, folks to take a look at that piece. There's also a Choose Democracy pledge at the end that I would um, encourage you all to, to review and, and um, sign if you feel called to do so. And so I think I'll end, we're getting, I think at our bewitching time now it, by asking Jason just to post a slide, because um, I imagine the group that's participating is is practical in nature and is interested in things that they can do um, in this moment. And so I pulled together just some um, resources uh, about kind of maximizing voter participation, which is really key um, uh, in this moment. And maybe I'll wait for, for Jason to catch up with the slide. Okay, if I might just jump in while we're waiting for that. Uh... In a, in a minute, we're going to go into uh, breakout rooms for everyone, and we'll have you address that question that Jana raised at the outset, namely, uh, what can we do in our communities to ensure a peaceful election transition and to try to prevent violence at uh, Black Lives Matter protests? Maria. No, that's great. And this is meant to segue right into that conversation. Um, just pr provide some resources and links to kind of act, um, ongoing initiatives, both focused on um, getting out the vote, how to serve as a poll worker. Um, I would flag power to the polls. So that's kind of all on the GOTV uh, side. And then, um, you know, on the how to ensure that all votes are counted uh, and, in, and defending the integrity of democratic processes, um, I, would, I would commend the resource Hold the Line, a guide to defending democracy, which focuses on how to organize local election protection groups. So kind of how to do community organizing around the election. And in particular, it, it, um, it suggests ways to think about mass nonviolent action in the event event that, um, you know, the results of the election are not upheld. So it draws on international cases of nonviolent resistance to kind of inform what ordinary people can do to protect the results of the election. And then uh, to David's uh, point about the real necessity of preventing and mitigating violence um, in communities, this is where kind of, again, community leaders, religious leaders, women, again, are going to play such an important role, I think, in kind of being the glue 
to keep communities together, to um, resolve conflicts, diffuse violence. And these are just a few initiatives that are focusing on violence prevention initiatives, including online virtual trainings that folks can, can participate in. Pache Bene, East Point Peace Academy, Cure Violence, DC Peace Team, they're all offering courses in kind of violence de-escalation, um, third party um, by, you know, bystander intervention and the like. So I guess, you know, I'll just end with that, um, you know, repetition of the theme of, of vote, vote, vote. Um, and then, you know, um, the necessity of centering vulnerable communities in, you know, this electoral period and certainly what follows. There's already been an uptick, uh, uptick in violence targeting vul vulnerable people, black, brown, people of color, and it's so important to center their, their, their voices, um, their experiences, and their leadership in the movements that we are participating in, um, you know, going forward. So I, I think, you know, the bottom line is that we, we do have all the tools at our disposal, I think, to, to build a more just and peaceful society and world. And so there's a lot of work that that remains, but I, I think um, I think we can do it. So I'll, I'll conclude with that. Wonderful, wonderful. Uh, inspiring and very, very helpful. So we'll have about seven minutes, everyone, to be in breakout groups. Uh, and in a second, Jason's going to put it on the screen and just click on their join. And then after that, we'll come back and you'll uh, have some questions, put them into the chat, and then we'll continue this, the discussion. So Jason, uh, why don't you get us into the rooms now, please? Great, and just wanna make sure we have the prompt um, to share. Um, so the prompt that um, I'm gonna put it in the chat here, um, and I'll also say it out loud. What can we in our community do to help ensure a peaceful electoral transition and reduce the risk of violence at Black Lives Matter protests. So again, I'm going to um, put that in the chat. Um, and then, um, again, what can we in our community do to help ensure a peaceful electoral transition, and reduce the risk of violence at Black Lives Matter protests? You'll be able to discuss that in a breakout room. So when you get the pop-up on your screen, just click join and that'll send you into a room uh, with a number of other participants here. And we'll see you back in seven minutes. Again, welcome back from your breakout sessions. I hope you had a chance to get to know someone else and articulate some of your responses and your thoughts to our speakers. If you'd like, please put your questions, your comments in the chat box and I'll be collecting those and posing questions to David and Maria. Okay. I have one here um, from some students. Um, they're asking, Maria, you mentioned the, the reference to the Proud Boys in your, in your talk. And um, last night in the debate, we heard um, the president say, stand down and stand by. And we learned um, this morning that overnight, there was a significant increase in people who felt that that was a, a call. Um, the question then becomes, what can we do to engage and neutralize this kind of mobilization, particularly as we're thinking about um, prevention, prevention of violence? There we go. Um, yeah, that's a really, that's a great question. And for me, that was kind of the, the, the startling moment of last night when I heard that comment and it was kind of a, um, not a shock entirely, but um, very, very uh, disconcerting and concerning. Um, I mean, I guess what I would say is here's where, um, you know, strong uh, influential voices within communities um, are going to be really important to send out the counter message that we will not um, tolerate or support this type of far right paramilitary white nationalism, white nationalist behavior. And, you know, we will organize against it. I think, you know, one thing that we've seen in a number it, like responses to far right rallies, for example, after Charlottesville, other places, 
is that kind of the, the counter mobilizations have been so much larger and bigger and bolder that it's kind of, you know, put the far right groups off their pedestal, if you will. So I think out organizing and kind of outnumbering in general um, is really, really important. Um, I think, you know, um, thinking about ways to counter their message um, without just relying on street confrontations and clashes. So expanding the repertoire of nonviolent actions to, um, you know, kind of uh, send a strong signal through symbols, um, through, you know, uh, going slow. There are lots of kind of ways that, um, you know, you can kind of send a strong community message um, that go well beyond kind of just the, the traditional street rallies and demonstrations. So, I mean, I think centering the voices of community leaders and and amplifying their counter messaging um, and what they stand for and in inviting people to join them, centering and amplifying those messages, like, you know, expanding the repertoire of nonviolent uh, tactics, I think is really key. And just the connections, the organizing, the coalitions, activating them within communities, I think uh, are, you know, three things that immediately come to mind. And just to put a little research on that question, Oliver Kaplan um, has done some research on Colombia and how communities, for example, have organized against paramilitary groups and kind of militia actors. And the key finding um, in his research was that communities that were in that did the most self organizing so that formed kind of parallel structures institutions um, were very organized were the ones that were able to prevent these militia groups from inflicting a lot of violence violence and harm in communities. And we're already seeing that across the country with Black Lives Matter. In Minneapolis, there was an excellent article by Hari Han um, in the New York Times about how community leaders, religious, secular, came together um, and organized to uh, counter far-right violence, opportunism, looting, all of that kind of stuff. So it's like organization, organization, organization. We have a, a series of questions on, on that point that have come in in the course of this conversation. So clearly there is a high degree of interest and concern around what it means to organize in response to, to paramilitary action. So we'll just um, note that that is a, a high level, of, there's a high level of interest in that. There's also a high level of interest here in thinking about how we understand property damage and how do we, and categorizing property damage and distinguishing it from violence. Um, one particular articulation of the many that are coming in, isn't there an important distinction between violence and property destruction? Is there ever a role for property destruction in nonviolent protest? I'm thinking, for example, of Daniel Berrigan burning his draft card as a nonviolent protest that nevertheless included symbolic property destruction. Okay, here we go. Um, so th those were also excellent questions. And I would just, you know, maybe one rejoinder, since there's a lot of interest in the paramilitary groups, the other kind of tactical thing I would put out there is kind of the role of joy and humor encountering far right paramilitary activity their their kind of their actions are are grounded in fear and anger, uh, anger and divisiveness and sometimes developing tactics that highlight joy and unity and even humor um, can be effective counters to those groups and i'm thinking of one example um, you know during the charlottesville far right protests and there was an initiative to like have an oompa oompa band kind of marching at the end of the far right parade, if you will, and kind of like sending a totally shocking counter message and just, but like, you know, very different from what one would expect. So I think thinking creatively about counter messaging and counter tactics that center joy, humanity, and humor are really kind of other ways to think about countering these, these groups. And so on the, on, the, on the question of property damage, this is the uh, kind of perennial um, topic of discussion for activists about, you know, what constitutes violence, is property damage, um, you know, what is it 
considered. And the reality is that it's in a gray, murky area. And so um, it's true, property damage that has been strategic, thoughtful, part of an overarching campaign. Uh, for example, some of the targeting of, of nuclear facilities, the Berrigan actions, they um, you know, were arguably very effective because they were um, part of a campaign and people knew why they were being done and how they were connected to the overarching goal. So sometimes the challenge of kind of more spontaneous um, you know, property damage, looting, things like that, is that people perceive it. Again, it's, it's less about is it violent or nonviolent. That's almost less important than how do other people perceive it that you want to join your movement or that you want to support your movement. And the challenge with some of these, um, you know, some of these actions is that they um, kind of, they, they signify chaos and disorder. And people generally don't want to be part of actions that are kind of chaotic in nature. And so I think that's kind of one of the challenges and the reasons why it's kind of a slippery slope, if you will, when you start kind of bringing um, some of these tactics into the mix. And so I think, you know, there's a difference between tactics and strategy. So there may be some tactical rationale for using counter violence or, you know, uh, self defense. You know, we can think of a number of examples for that. And, but then there's the pic bigger picture of what is most strategic, what is going to attract ma the maximum support and participation in the cause. And what, how does that affect how I think about kind of the tactics? So I, I would just, you know, offer that, but this is always a, a big, long conversation in, in activist meetings. Thank you, yes. Um, well, there is an, another series of questions, another um, theme here is the questions coming from people located outside the United States, one from Canada, one from South Korea, it looks like. And I will read one articulation of that question as to how people can be acting in solidarity with movements located in the US at this time. I write this question from Canada. What sort of advice for solidarity movements can you suggest in a time of pandemic-induced closed borders? Could you talk about how nonviolent solidarity voice ampli amplification could happen meaningfully online? There you go. Um, yeah, international solidarity. I mean, I think this has been one of the defining features of the Black Lives Matter movement. I mean, you recall seeing the, the actions of solidarity all around the world um, during the, the mass protests um, following George Floyd's uh, murder. So it was just, you know, incredibly powerful and heartening, I think, to, be, to see the level of support um, for anti-racism work around the world. I think so, you know, the, the messages, the, you know, the gatherings, so those the symbolic protests of support that are posted on social media to demonstrate the scope um, of interest and and support, I think, is really Im important um, for morale and then beyond uh, for for pressure um, coming from different different places. I think around this election, um, kind of centering the message of um, count every vote is going to be really important and kind of uplifting and amplifying that message um, is, you know, something that maybe groups in, in different countries and around the world could do. Um, and, you know, just continuing to, to focus and highlight in your social media messaging and the like, the really amazing work of uh, grassroots groups like Black Lives Matter, Sunrise, Poor People's Campaigns, like kind of, you know, the more that those kind of voices can be centered in the social media um, messaging and, you know, in the shows of solidarity, I think the, the better. Thank you. I'd like to turn this over to David now to, to comment on some of these questions. Yeah. Well, thank you uh, very much, uh, Maria. I agree completely with your re remarks. Uh, on the question of property damage and, and uh, violence, uh, there's a, a quote now that many of us have heard that's very important from Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Because uh, he was often asked about the urban uprisings that took place in the 1960s. 
and he said and reminded us that, as he put it, the riot is the voice of the unheard. It's a response of immediacy to oppressive and unbearable conditions and acts of egregious uh, abuse and violence. Uh, so we have to understand that those who, to, who neglect the needs of communities and who continue oppressive policies uh, are the ones who are creating the conditions that lead to those sorts of uprisings. But at the same time, Dr. King was very clear and insistent that uh, property damage, rioting, uh, any of these sorts of uh, destructive acts should not be part of our repertoire of strategy. Uh, to really bring about political change and social change, we need to recognize the power of nonviolent action itself and of disciplined nonviolent commitment uh, in order to bring about the change. And as we know from the history of the civil rights movement, uh, the major significant changes for the Voting Rights Act in 1964, the uh, uh, 65, the Civil Rights Act of 1964, uh, they came about through a strategic nonviolent uh, action. So that's an important distinction for us to make, perhaps that's from Dr. King's time that I think is still relevant today. Uh, and it's just the last thing I would say substantively is, uh, as Maria has been pointing out, the organizing opportunities and needs are huge. There are many things that we can do and that we need to prepare. And really it means we need to organize starting now and have the discussions now in our churches and community centers in our classrooms and in our uh, universities and colleges and high schools uh, to begin to think about what we can do, what will we do if it turns out badly. Uh, and so as we mobilize to turn out the vote, uh, we need to mobilize and start thinking about what those strategic actions will need to be uh, for us in our communities and then at the national level. Uh, and that can happen effectively if we're not starting to prepare even now. And thanks, Maria, for giving us all the insight and wisdom, but also those wonderful resources in terms of information, uh, but also some of the places we can go now to begin to have conversations with groups nationally about the things we can do and prepare for the coming uh, several months of uncertainty in our country. David, can I ask you one more question here that's come in from a number of directions? And that is, there are a number of people who are asking specifically about working with youth and those who are articulating a question that may be shared by others besides just youth. And that is to say, there are certain groups that are eager for fast results. Someone writes, my fear is that because of impatience, they decide to choose violent means um, rather than nonviolent ones. So what would you say to those who are already feeling impatient with nonviolent tactics um, in our organizing? What, are, what have you found useful in that regard? Well, it does take time often for significant social change, and we have to go step by step in reforms often. But there are also moments when there's this dramatic transition that takes place. Uh, when we think about, for example, how uh, e equality of marriage and same-sex marriage was condemned so widely, and then all of a sudden over a course of just a few years and with some major court decisions, our country has become much more accepting on this issue. And with the Black Lives Matter movement, that we have more than 15 million people who've been participating according to the figures and the data that Maria was showing, uh, sharing with us. Uh, it shows that dramatic action can be possible. Uh, I think we have to be persistent most of all and continue to take action and recognize that the challenges before us are overwhelming. But on this issue of an election transition, what we're about is saving our democracy, saving our country. And we are the majority. We have a massive majority in this country on behalf of that position. If the president does try to steal this election, he'll be isolated uh, and we'll have to organize wisely to bring the whole country together to the call for the fundamental justice and to end any, um, any attempt to steal the election to have a coup, as Maria was saying. Uh, so we, we do have support. We are the, the majority. We have power and let's be smart about organizing it. We don't have to use violence for that. If we use violence, actually, our chances of success would be diminished. Well, thank you so much, um, David. And thank you so much, Maria, for generously sharing of your time and coming here and participating with us, sharing of your expertise and putting it very much into practice, bringing the best of what we know from your work 
um, to rise to the challenges and opportunities that are today. So thank you ever so much for, for being with us. One more word about what's coming up. Next week, Liz Theo Harris, from, who is co-coordinator of the Poor People's Campaign, will be joining us. That's October 7th at 1230. Liz Theo Harris will be with us. And then the, after that, the capstone of the Spore Part series will be a October 10th half day online nonviolence direct action training. And that will be taking place from 2 to 5 p.m. And these, this, all of this is Eastern time. What you're seeing, um, what I'm sharing with you is on the colloquium homepage. So all information is available there. And please let us know if you have questions and we look forward to seeing you next time.